morning. Our scripture reading this morning will be from Philippians chapter 2. I know it's more enjoyable to watch the kids <laughs> e egress. It is. It's excitement back there. Uh, um, Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 through 11. Um, and just as you turn there, you know, one of the great verses I remember hearing after becoming a Christian and just, you know, you contemplate certain things about the work that Christ is doing in you. And Philippians 1, 6, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That it, you know, our salvation is in the hands of God and our sanctification is in the hands of God. And that should be a reassuring thing for us while, you know, we, we can be held accountable. It is his work. And we, we, we rely on that. And so when you, turn, when you get to Philippians 2, it, you know, you're, it's in that same vein of thinking. Philippians 2, 1 through 11. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Lord, I, I pray that we stand in awe of you. That when we look at creation, when we look at this world, that we stand in awe. When we look at the circumstances in our lives, that we stand in awe. That when we look at your word, we stand in awe of what you have done. And that it would, as, as Paul says, complete my joy, that it would bring joy. To know you and to have you, that you are ours, that we are yours. You know, and you, in, in scripture we find you refer to us as brothers, you refer to us as th that we will share an inheritance. It, that, that is, we are undeserving and yet you extend that to us. But, but we must have a, a mind that is like Christ, love that is like Christ, and how uh, the example that you put forth, humility, that, that you put yourself last, that others are more significant. Is that true of us? Do we put the interest of others before our own? We long to show the love of Christ to those people around us. Or do we, out of selfish ambition, ignore others? And Lord, you were an example as a servant. A servant not, not just to come and to serve, but that you were obedient to the point of death for our sake. That we that we would be offered life, that we would be offered eternity with you, righteousness in you. You were obedient to death for your namesake, for your glory. Lord, if, if we are not lifting up your name, if we are not making you known, if we are not glorifying you, then do we understand what salvation is if indeed 
God exalted your name above all names, but if we are unwilling to do that, do we understand what we've been called to? I pray that we would have a mind like Christ and that we would humble ourselves, but the priority is to make him known. May that be true of us. And, and as this is stated, it, it's echoed in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 5.13, And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Lord, every knee will bow Every tongue will confess. I pray that we would do it here and now, that we would have the promise of salvation. And we will not be forced to do it at judgment. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Well, as Daniel said, those kids are excited. I hope you are as excited, if not more than they are, to hear a word from the Lord, not a word from your pastor, but a word from the Lord himself. And so if you would, turn in your Bibles there to 1 Peter chapter 4, heading a little bit different direction here this morning. 1 Peter chapter 4, it's uh, there towards the back of the New Testament there. It's a very, very short book. It's easy to miss, but I'll give you a clue. It's right before 2 Peter. That's all I'm going to give you. 1 Peter chapter 4. If you have to look it up there at the front of your Bible to see exactly where 1 Peter is, do so. But let's turn in God's word and let's read what our king has to say to us here this morning as his church. 1 Peter chapter 4. We'll pick up there and uh, I'll start reading in verse 7. The word of God says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Verse 10, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, as we open up your word, we pray that our hearts would be open to you, our minds alert, with the great expectation, O oh God, to hear from you. Grant us the wisdom to apply it, the grace and the power to live it out in humble obedience before you as our act of worship to you, that you would be glorified in your church. In Christ's name, amen. Well, I think... Uh, one of the most epic failures of modern day science is the accepting of the theory of evolution as fact. That science, of course, as we know, denounces religion because, as they claim, it is solely built on this foundation of faith, while at the same time, science prides itself on being built on the foundation of fact. Things that are measurable, observable, things that are tangible, things that can be proven through study and research. But it amazes me all the time how much of these assumptions that science makes in holding up evolution as true. For example, scientists that hold to uh, evolution believe that, of course, man came from monkey, that came from some other simpler life forms all the way down to one single simple form of life. I talk about this with my kids often because it is a massive worldview and th it is a godless worldview uh, versus our worldview that there's not just an intelligent designer 
but there is actually a creator who is personal and who has made himself known to the pinnacle of his creation, which are human beings because we're made in his likeness and his image. And I want my kids to be able to think reasonably uh, about these things and how to argue them, not just from the standpoint of scripture, but also from just good old common sense. And when we look at, at what I would call, what they call macro evolution, the, these massive changes from one species to the next, I, I, I ask my kids, you know, varied questions to get them thinking as to why this cannot be. It is impossible. It runs against all logic and reason. There's no common sense to it whatsoever. And I want them to understand it and to be able not just to win an argument, but to be able to give people a defense of what they believe and the hope that they have in Christ. And so you look at the theory of evolution, for an example, um, it is often taught that bats came from mice because the bat kind of looks like a mouse. You know, you clip off its wings and it looks like a mouse. And I told, I told my girls, I said, so if the bat came from a mouse over millions of years, so let's look at the mouse. How does the mouse survive? It runs quickly. It scatters. It runs in its little hole. It, it gets away from, from prey so that it can survive. But over millions of years, according to evolution, uh, their, their hind legs began to grow webbing, to grow wings. But at one point, so then at one point, they can't either fly nor can they run and get away because those wings aren't working. And they only have two sets of, one set of legs that is trying to get away, and the other set is just flopping around, so the mouse is now dead and extinct. None of it makes any sense. Or I arrive at, at deeper thoughts like this one. If man came from monkey, why did we lose our tail? You ever thought about that? That's a deep thought. I know. Don't, don't worry about it. It's okay. Why did we lose our tail? I mean, honestly, right? As we grow older, nobody wants to stumble and fall. If you have a tail, you ain't ever falling, right? So why do we lose our tail? I don't, it, it's just silly, I know. But just thinking these things through makes no sense. Um, or um, a more a modern so-called scientific uh, uh, theory that is out there is that we came from, from aliens, okay? We came from a higher intelligence, a, a higher form of life that brought down human beings in some way, in some, in some form or fashion. And uh, there's, there's a show on, on TV that I find quite entertaining, and it's called Ancient Aliens. Um, you know, don't waste your time. Maybe watch one episode and be done with it. And, but the idea is that the ancients that lived two, three, four thousand years ago, they're, they're much further removed than us today, so therefore we are more advanced than they are, right? That's the theory of evolution. But what they cannot understand and what they cannot explain is what these ancients built with such engineering precision uh, on such a massive, massive scale like the pyramids and and all these, and it, it's all over the world, and, and science cannot explain how in the world did these people do it, especially because they were supposed to be so much dumber than we are. How did they figure it out? Aliens gave them the information. Little ship zipped down, talked to the Egyptians, gave them a master plan, and said, now go build this pyramid. And, and it really... If, if that is your worldview, how else do you explain how we are so far removed from them, thousands and thousands of years, and yet we can't figure out some of the things that they did with such precision and engineering genius so that we have these two competing world views. And so we developed over millions and millions of years and I like how one creation scientist once asked an evolutionist this question. So which came first, 
the mouth to hold the food, the teeth to chew the food, the tongue to swallow the food, the esophagus to transport the food, the stomach and its acids to digest the food, or the intestines to be rid of the food which came first. You understand the point. It had to be all fully intact immediately in order for us to survive and thrive. And we look at the human body, and it's, it is an amazing, amazing machine. Uh, Psalm 139, 14 says this, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. And God designed the human body, as we know, with, with many different parts that carry out many different functions so that the body is the totality of its parts. Each part is different. Each part was designed for a specific function. Each part is important. The body is made up of many different parts, and yet it is one body. And when we look at the human body, we see that there is unity in its diversity, which, as I've said before, that's where the word university comes from. That's what it means. It's made up of two Latin words, uni, meaning one, and versus, meaning against or turned. In other words, there is unity in our community of differences. There is unity in diversity. Who came up with that idea? It wasn't man's idea, it was God's. And we see it, of course, in the human body, and we see it in all of his marvelous creation. All kinds of animals, all kinds of plants. There are oak trees and pine trees and walnut trees. All trees have similar structure, and yet no trees are exactly alike. Why? Because God loves unity and oneness, but he also loves diversity within that unity. And so it is with the church. And so God uses the analogy of a body to get us to understand this dynamic called the church. For all who are in Christ are his children. We are one in Christ. We are one in spirit. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 says this, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And yet within our oneness of the church, there is this diversity. We're, we're all different. And God's desire is to galvanize these differences for his service and for his glory. And one of the ways that God has unified his church is the same way that he has also diversified his church, and that is by distributing to each of us spiritual gifts, spiritual gifts for service. So this morning as we're kind of getting geared up for a new church here, I want us to look at this passage, particularly verses 10 and 11, and I'll read them again. Again, notice what Peter says in verse 10. As each has received a gift, talking about spiritual gifts, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so Peter is in the process in this letter of encouraging these persecuted and suffering Christians in this Roman province. And towards the end of this letter, he reminds these suffering believers that one day the Lord is going to return, and therefore Peter implores them to persevere in faithful service to the Lord and his church. So as this new church year is upon us quickly, uh, we'll probably not have to endure much persecution as we serve, but as you well know, we still need encouragement and we still need perseverance. We have many servants in this church, many who faithfully serve in so many different ways, and I thank God for each and every one of you. 
We need you. We need each other. And I pray that there would not be a single member of this body within this church who is not serving in some capacity. We should not be sitting on the sidelines. And so this morning, I hope as a means of encouragement and perhaps as a means of conviction, I want us to see this morning four significant truths regarding serving in Christ's church that Peter says you cannot overlook these. Do not overlook these. Four significant truths regarding serving. First, Peter declares that service is a gift. It's a gift. It's a gift from God. Looking back there at verse 10, he says, as each has received a gift. And this word gift that Peter is referring to here, of course, is our spiritual gifts that every believer, every one of us has, and you actually receive that gift at the very moment of your rebirth, your conversion to Christ. Paul actually lists these gifts in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. And each gift is therefore a divine enablement for ministry and service to the body of Christ. And it is the Holy Spirit who distributes these gifts to each believer as he sovereignly chooses. So we don't pray that God give us certain spiritual gifts, but we can pray that he would make known to us what those spiritual gift or gifts are. God has given you at least one spiritual gift to be utilized within the local body of believers for the building up of the body of Christ. Every born again believer of the church, every one of us is divinely equipped for serving within this household of faith. And it also means that every one of us is vitally important and every one of us is needed because God has uniquely equipped each of us to serve. And so what area of service are you passionate about? What motivates you? How God has gifted you needs to be discovered. How do you discover it? You can discover it through prayer. You can discover it through Bible study. You can also discover it by jumping in and serving within this local body. Some of you might get an opportunity to fill in on a particular Sunday for Sunday school and teach. And you may discover through several weeks of teaching that maybe you're not very good at it. Or maybe you discover through what others also have to say that God has equipped you to teach. It doesn't mean when you begin to teach early on that you become a master teacher. No, it's developed over the course of time. It certainly is. I'm still learning all the things I'm trying to need to learn when it comes to improving in various ways but you discover your giftedness because you have a passion in a particular area or several areas but not just a passion but then God gives you the ability to do what he has equipped you to do and to do it well and to grow as you continue to serve in so many ways it's a gift from God because it's a gift it should not be neglected. It should not be ignored. So, Peter declares, service is a gift from God. Second, he points out that service is a matter of stewardship. Don't miss this. It is a matter of stewardship. Again, looking at verse 10. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So these gifts that God has given us are never to be used selfishly, but they're to be used to build up the body of Christ, to nourish the family of faith. We're commanded to use our spiritual gifts to serve one another, and as we do so, Peter points out that we're being good stewards of God's grace that he has poured out upon us. And Peter points out that these gifts are grace gifts. They are a part of what he describes as God's varied grace. 
that he has given to us. And that word varied can be translated as manifold, which means many-sided. There is God's saving grace, and then there's God's serving grace, or as Daniel pointed out earlier, God's sanctifying grace, that he is in the process of sanctifying us. He is in the process of spiritually growing us and maturing us and changing us. And he does this great work within us. And apart from him, we cannot spiritually grow. But within that sanctifying grace, we have a responsibility. And that is to yield to him, to submit to him, to obey him, to, uh, to carry out the uh, various forms of, of spiritual disciplines, of reading God's word and spending time meditating upon it and lining our lives up by submitting ourselves to it and, and praying and, and, and going to him and praising him and asking him for help and interceding on behalf of one another. This is the work that he is doing in you and in me. And one of those means of sanctifying grace is serving. It is serving. It is you pouring yourself out for the benefit of others within the local body of Christ. And that is what Peter is, is talking about. And, and the bottom line is this. If you are not serving within the local body, you are, one, you're being disobedient, ultimately, to God himself, who said serve. We see the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why, <laughs> that's why Paul said what he said in Philippians. Uh, if, if Jesus stooped so low to serve, who are we not to say, oh, I ain't stooping that low? You ever wash somebody's feet? I'm not like saying we need to go around washing people's feet, but you ever done it? It's pretty nasty. And it's very humbling. And it was a very common practice in Jesus' day because they didn't go around walking in Nike shoes. They went around walking in sandals all, everywhere all day. And their feet would be sweaty and dirty and muddy and nasty. And then when they would go to eat a meal together, especially at somebody else's home, there would be a servant of that house. And that lowly servant was responsible to washing all the feet of the guests before they entered that home. We think about washing hands, washing feet was a big deal. You know, the reason that washing feet was a big deal is because they didn't sit at tables like we do with the feet under the table. They reclined at a table. So you're sitting on the floor and your feet are to the left of you and there's Miss Gale sitting to my left with my nasty smelly feet right there beside her as she's about to enjoy her meal if my feet are not washed. But a servant is responsible for washing those feet. And then we get, of course, to the upper room and we know what happened there. They go to that upper room. It's the last meal that Jesus is going to have the last Passover he's going to celebrate with his disciples. Everything is set up, but there's no servant to wash the feet. And Jesus looks around. None of the apostles are willing to do it. And so Jesus says, let me teach you guys a lesson. And he takes off his robe and he puts on this towel and he takes the basin and he begins to, in the disciples' mind, shame himself. That is not your role, Rabbi. That is not your role, King Jesus. That needs to be somebody else's role. All right, then Peter, why didn't you stand up and do it? Because, Lord, it is beneath me. And if it's beneath me, it's got to be beneath you. Why are you of such authority stooping so low to embarrass us by washing our feet. That's why Peter said, you ain't going to do it. But Jesus does it because he is giving them an example of absolute humility that has to exist within the body of Christ for the church to be healthy and growing and moving forward in our spiritual maturity together. That's why Paul said, 
don't just look out for your own interests, but look out for the interests of others and actually see them as more important than you. And when we begin to see people as more important than us, then pride begins to take a back seat and humility begins to drive begins to drive us and steer us and direct us as it did Jesus Christ. So service is a gift from God and it is a matter of stewardship. You and I were saved to pour ourselves out for the benefit of others, to serve Christ and his church and to not serve faithfully is to neglect and to ignore God's gift to us. So he gives us a gift. He says, unwrap it, cherish it, and use it for his glory and for his namesake. We are to be good stewards of this grace. We are to take something that does not belong to us and to use it in such a way that the master is well pleased. Ephesians 4, 7 says, But grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. 1 Peter 4, 14, Paul commands us to not neglect the gift that is in you. It is a matter of stewardship, the stewardship of God's grace. Third, Peter points out that Service relies on God's resources and upon God's power. Again, look there at verse 11, the first part of that verse where it says, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. So here Peter basically is giving us two general categories of spiritual gifts. You have your speaking gifts, and you have your service gifts. Uh, there are those gifts which fall under the heading speaking gifts. Such gifts would include teaching, uh, preaching or prophecy, same thing, and exhortation. The service gifts are those that would include giving, administration, service, and mercy. And so Peter says of those who have one or more of the speaking gifts, that they are to preach and teach what? The word of God, the oracles of God, so that ultimately opinions and speculations don't matter. All that matters for the teacher and preacher is truth. That's all that really counts. So the prophet, the teacher, the exhorter are to speak forth only what God has already spoken. For those who have one or more of the service gifts, they are to serve, it says, notice, in the strength that God supplies. God supplies that strength. We are to never serve or minister to one another in our own strength and in our own wisdom. We need God's strength to effectively serve. We need to rely on God. We need to be in his word daily. We need to be praying daily. We need to obey him daily. That is how you become the effective servant. Of Christ. Paul points out in Philippians 2, 12 and 13, that as we work out our own salvation, he says that it is God that is at work in us. And what is he doing in us? What is this work that he is doing in us as we serve him in serving his body? It's really amazing what God does for us. And it says that he is giving us the power of and the desire to do his holy will. That's the work he's doing in us. And it's really a humbling thing, right? I mean, there are some times when you guys might compliment me on a sermon. There's other times when you may not. Either way, for me, it isn't my fault. No, it, it's, it's, I don't get any of the credit, right? Because whatever work God Whatever work I'm doing before you in preaching or teaching doesn't come from the power and wisdom of Eric. If it came from the power and wisdom of Eric, it would mean nothing. But if it comes 
through the power and wisdom and the desire that God has planted within me, then it really matters. Then it has a profound effect upon the community of the saints. I don't mind compliments. I don't mind correction. I don't mind any of it. But if I ever receive a compliment, what I've tried to create a habit of saying is, my response is, I might say thank you, but I'll almost always say, well, praise the Lord. Because it, it, the praise doesn't go to me. It, it ultimately goes to him. And, 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 and we, can, uh, we, we can compliment one another. We, we can praise one another. We can speak encouraging. You did a great job in doing X, Y, Z. And your response is, praise the Lord. Thank you. Praise the Lord. That was a great meal. Thank you. Praise the Lord. You did a great job setting up that fellowship hall, moving all those chairs and all those tables and wiping them clean. We don't always do that. We don't always say those things, right? You know, that's part of one of our problems, right, is the expectations that we have of one another. That's why we don't always compliment each other because the expectation is, well, that's your team, that's your responsibility. Go set that mess up. But if they didn't set that stuff up, no, well, we wouldn't be eating. And if we don't eat as Baptists, <laughs> we're, we're in heat big trouble. Somebody's got to set up the tables and the chairs so we can eat. And I thank God for it. Th these light bulbs. I mean, somebody's got to change them. I don't like heights. I'm not getting on a ladder and changing those bulbs. So we got to find somebody who doesn't have a fear of heights. We got people in here that are fine with that. And so they get up there and they change those light bulbs. They get up there and they install that machine. They get up there and, and they, they do these things. They put a sign out front. They're greeting people in the front. They're greeting people in the back. All of these things that help this body function. And I would implore you to get into the habit of thanking people for what they do. Now I say that and I'm convicted of that because I don't always do that. And that's why I've said so many times, I pray somebody at, the, at my house to my wife and my wife says, well, did you tell them? And I'm always like, no, no. Well, you need to tell them. And she's exactly right. It is, it is, it's easy to correct each other. It's easy to grumble and complain. It comes natural, right? The mouth just naturally curves down, doesn't naturally smile. You have to force a smile. It, but grumbling, that comes natural. Mm -hmm. That's murmuring. But we have to smile. We have to praise each other. We have to compliment one another. We have to build each other up within the body of Christ and say, you did a great job. I appreciate your act of service. Ms. Gail, I thank you for dropping by the house when I wasn't there, and she dropped off garden vegetables. Garden vegetables. Uh, garden vegetables are much better than store-bought vegetables. Amen? Thank you, ma'am. We appreciate it. And so we do these things for the building up of the body that Christ would be glorified. And we do it in his power and in his strength. Finally, in closing, Peter points out a fourth vital truth about serving, and that is the motive of all of our service, which goes into what I just said. Fourth, all service is done for the glory of God. It's not done for the glory of self. It's done for the glory of God. As Peter goes on to spell out at the end of verse 11, Whoever speaks is one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that, here it is, in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ because to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. So in everything we do, in preaching sermons, in praying, in changing light bulbs, in wiping babies' bottoms, in all of the things that we do as a body of believers to run this church, to serve each other as a family, we do it all for the glory of God our King. Because if He cleaned our feet, certainly we can do that for one another. In everything we do, it is for the glory of our great God that it is his glory that motivates us and encourages us and keeps us doing what we do. 
Have you ever grown weary in serving? Have you ever grown frustrated with people in serving? Have you ever received more complaining than you do compliments in serving? If your motivation is for the glory of God, you'll persevere through all of that. You'll persevere through all of that. Because we need His strength. Because the bottom line is, people are people and people aren't easy. I love what one guy said. He said, the problem with the church is that it's just so full of people. People are people. People grumble. We complain. We grow frustrated. We want to vent our frustration to somebody else. We, we do these things, though we know. Mm, bridle of the tongue. It's hard. And we're going we're, we're gonna to let it loose at times, and then we know we shouldn't, and then we go apologize and oh, I shouldn't have said that apologize repent confess move forward and persevere in all we do because our motive is that God be glorified as you and I are built up in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ and we we need that we need each other, and that's the beauty of these spiritual gifts. I don't know if you know what your spiritual gift or gifts are. I pray that you do. If you're not certain and you're confused about spiritual gifts, you can come and talk to me. That's one of the things that we do cover in our pre-membership luminary class. I do have these, these, these things called spiritual gift tests. It's helpful. It doesn't necessarily, it's not, you know, foul proof. But I want you to think of it like this. It's like God is an artist, and he has, he has a palette. And on that palette are all these different colored paints. And then he's got this canvas, and he's painting this portrait. And this portrait is you. And each of these colors represent these different spiritual gifts that he has given to his church. And so he takes some of this. And he begins to fill it in. Then he might take a dab of another one. And he begins to fill it in. He takes a little bit of, of another one. And he begins to fill it in. The point that Peter and Paul are making is you are a unique individual that God has gifted in such a unique way that there is no one exactly like you within the body to serve. That is why we need each other and the more effective we are in our service to one another the more we grow as spiritual human beings created in the image and likeness of God saved by his grace made alive spiritually by him and we will grow as a spiritual body a family of faith but we have to serve and we need to do it with effectiveness and for the glory of Christ our King. Would you pray with me? As you're bowing your head and closing your eyes, a couple of verses to ponder as in the next several weeks we will be signing up to serve in various capacities. We'd actually like to start with a blank slate so that every single member needs to re-sign up for perhaps where you are currently serving or perhaps a new area of service. But as we move forward together, I think about Philippians 2.14, do all things without grumbling or complaining. Another wonderful principle, Colossians 3. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. How often, Father, we need to remember that, that as we are serving one another, we are ultimately serving Christ. 
our, our king is here in our midst, what would we do for him? How would we serve him? Well, Christ would say to us, as you serve my body, you serve me. Father, help me to remember that. Help us to remember that. And as we enter into a new year of signing up to serve, may we first pray, Lord, where would you have me serve? In what capacity? Where, where, where do I fit in? What would you have me do? Lord, how could I use the spiritual gift and gifts that you have given me to build up this body for your name's sake and for your glory? Father, I thank you for every individual member of this church and for how you have uniquely equipped every one of us to serve each other in such a way that without these individual members, we would not be the same family of faith. Where would the body be without the hand or the ear or the foot? You have made us one body because there is one Lord, one Spirit, one Father, and you abide in us. So, Father, whatever good we do, whatever good works we bear, it's because of you. It is because of you. And we give you thanks and glory for all of these things. Be glorified in your church, O oh God. And it's in Jesus' holy, most precious name we pray. Amen and amen. Love you guys. Have a blessed, wonderful week. Good to see you.